Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Awakening Aphrodite. I am your hostess, Amy Fournier. This show is all about helping you be more fit and healthy in mind, body, and spirit, as well as to balance your masculine and feminine energy, tap into your true source of power, your intuition, and awaken your authentic self. Today is a very special day for me. It is truly my supreme honor to introduce to you our guest today. She is a living legend in the field of women's empowerment and holistic health and fitness. None other than Sierra Bender is joining my show today. Somebody pinch me because this is really happening. Wow, Sierra's Biography is quite long. You'll have to forgive me. I am going to read it because there's so much here. I didn't want to miss some of the key stuff and she's going to jump in and embellish with that I missed. Sierra Bender is a women's empowerment and leadership expert. She's an entrepreneur, an advocate, an influencer, a researcher, a life transformer, and a best selling author. She has a very interesting backstory. So listen to this. As a semi-professional athlete, a model, a prosperous fitness and health biz business owner, and perfect marriage living in New Jersey, it would seem like as if Sierra had it all. However, on Christmas Eve in 1995, at the age of only 32, Sierra underwent a near-death experience as a result of an undiagnosed atopic pregnancy that led to a ruptured uterus. After being pronounced actually dead, modern medicine saved her life, but it didn't heal her. That was the beginning for Sierra. She then set out on an inner vision quest and an outdoor adventure across the globe. The journey of being a force of nature that Sierra is today reads like an odyssey. The search for her own healing, empowerment, and redefining success led her to Native American reservations, an ashram in India, Dalai Lama's home, whom she met, a jail cell in South Carolina, and a hut in the Amazon. Along the way, Sierra absorbed the collective teachings of the world's sages and leaders. She absorbed not just the collective teachings, but also tapped into her female essence, her inner women warrior, an innate and powerful entity directly at odds with the popular notion that success for a woman means walking in a man's shoes. Mm -hmm. Although Sierra could not give birth to children, she turned her pain into power as she likes to coin it and surrendered what was no longer of service to her. She channeled her intuitive motherly energy and gave herself permission to shine. This act of self-love gave birth to top-selling programs, a best-selling book, and another one on the way, and a clinically proven method that has helped millions awaken and pull forth their inner light to shine with her. Through the rites of passage, she's been led to her highest purpose and passion. She developed the Four Body Fit Institute, also known as the Mothership, where she, again, lifted to prospect the, the possible. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome none other than Sierra Barrett Bender to the show. Thanks, Amy. That was like a tongue twister, huh? Oh my, oh my God, God, I couldn't get all the words out. Your biography's so long. I was like crazy. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to read that and tell the backstory. Yes, well, I know there's so much more. I had another page of your bio, but I think the whole thing would be me stumbling over words. So I think I'd much rather share from you, Sierra. Tell us what you'd like to share with us about your story from your own words to where you are now in 2020, the very end of 2020. Wow. It's funny because I'm full, I went full circle. I'm back to where I started when I started my journey after my near death experience. And I said to myself that again, modern medicine saved my life, but didn't heal me. The doctors, therapists thought I was crazy because I intuitively knew I wasn't supposed to be pregnant and I wasn't happy. 
And I knew what I was doing was what I was conditioned to do as a woman. And my heart said one thing, my body said another, my mind said another, my soul is saying another. And I was so fragmented and out of alignment, actually that near death experience put me into alignment of who I am, why I'm here and what my true purpose is, which was a lot of pain, but it gave me some clarity on my purpose. Because literally I felt at times being a woman and being a young woman and, and like, am I crazy? Or why, what, what am I feeling this, this, as I call it, this righteous anger? What is this? And um, when I passed over, God said to me, I met Christ and God and said, love is not just an emotion. It's the most powerful force in the universe grounded by action and responsibility. Where are you not loving you, Sierra? Stop being a victim. You know, victim means to sacrifice. Why are you continually sacrificing yourself? And I was asked four profound questions, which then became the method, which then has helped millions come into alignment, just like I did. And the four questions I was asked was spiritually, when and why did you disconnect from the source of my love, God's love, creator, spirit, whatever that means to you. And I'm like, yeah, I remember when I was a little girl, my intuition, I was connected to nature. I was always listening. I was always asking questions, the curiosity, the innocence that has no fear. But then I also come from sexual abuse. So it was always a contradiction. And spirit, God creator was like my sanity at times because I was taught not to trust humans, right? The ones who love you the most are the ones who are hurting you. That doesn't make sense. And then mentally, what were the belief systems that took you further away from the source of my love, from your family, your culture, media, society in general, religion? I'm like, wow, I remember my first day of confession and the priest told me I didn't know how to speak to God. I'm like, wait a minute, if God is everywhere and everything, what do I need you for? And I got into trouble because I always had a mouth <laughs> and that truth. That truth that you have as a child, as a little young girl, because you're so connected and how we're so taught to give that power away and that intuition, which is our most powerful gift. And I remember that created doubt and fear in me and it took me further out of alignment of trusting God, my intuition, my primal instincts of a human being and then giving more power away. And then emotionally, why do you continually Punish yourself not feeling worthy of love. Why do you keep punishing yourself through food, eating disorders, through drugs, alcohol, bad relationships? You know, if you come from abuse or society is abusing, even if you don't come from abuse, the divine feminine is abused. We're all feeling it. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Why am I doing that? Why am I toning myself down? Why am I hurting myself? And I knew I had so much potential in possessing my possible, but I'd always sabotage myself. And then physically, why do you consistently resist my love? Why do you keep attracting the same actors in your life, actors and actresses in your life that tell you you're not worthy? It's all about control. You know, you, it's a false sense of control. It's the ego, it's the fear, it's the doubt. And so I really was like, wow, I can answer all four of those questions very easily but our ego wants to dance around them. And when I saw that truth of each one of those questions that I was asked and I can answer it like that, I, I had to own it. I had to own how, how I was giving my power away, but I also understood the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness is about letting it go. Whatever that person or that situation has played in your role of your life, it was like, wow, I have to let this go because if I don't, that's the righteous anger. They have that much control over my mind, my heart, my future. That pisses me off more to give that power away than it is to move through the fire and move through the pain. So how do you channel your anger and that righteous anger, which became one of the measurements of my four body fit method? What is righteous anger? Fascinating. Fa absolutely fascinating. I just, uh, there's, uh, there's so much I can kind of delve into there, but I have to ask you before we get into the details of that is you died, 
you were technically deemed as dead. What, do you remember what was that like? Did you do the whole, I saw light and all that? Like you said, you heard the voice of God. I mean, was it literally auditory in your ear? I mean, can you expand on that for us? Sure. Um, well, I saw myself out of my body when I was going into the operating room and they tied me down and I was in convulsions and I was, I was bleeding to death internally. So 80% of my blood was in my stomach. And my ego, which saved my life, and my physical strength because I was in shape, they even said that's what kept you alive when you came back. It was like, it wasn't just that the average person could have never survived that. But because my body was in great shape, and, and then when I came back, I was able to heal so quickly. And although I was in physically great shape, but my other body, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, were not. And I saw myself out of my body watching, hey, this is Sierra. She's going through this amazing experience of watching the operation. And it was really amazing because this was Sierra and her body and this lifetime. But my soul knew this is what I needed to go through. So it was like, you're so out of alignment with who you are, Sierra, and what your true potential is and why you're here. Let me remind you, like fine tuning a radio station, get back in alignment. And so my soul knew that. And my soul also knew my ego was so strong because of being a survivor that it needed to take that big of a sledgehammer over the head to awaken me to soften my ego, to get back into my body, into who I am. And the love for myself and my creator, God, whatever, you know, to me, God. And I remember I had insomnia for 17 years and the insomnia was running away from the pain, from the abuse. And I kept abusing myself different ways, but I looked great on the outside because I was in the fitness business. I had it all down. So it was really a way that I survived. And those those survival tools that once helped me as a child are now attacking me. They're harming me, they're hurting me because I am now attracting people who are hurting me again. Okay. And so when I had my conversation with God, the best way to describe it is Christ is like the middleman. Now I'm Catholic, I was brought up Catholic. I believe in God, I believe in creator and I believe in Christ and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm raised Catholic in Christ. Okay, so Christ came to me and was sitting on my bed and talking to me. And it was all intuitively. And I knew it, everything he was stating was true. And the more I surrendered into it, the more information I was downloading. You know, why am I here? Like my cellular memory of who I am, of why I'm here, my soul's memory, it was, it was, I, I, you know, even trying to explain it was, is, is very hard, you know, but to, to explain it to the best way possible is, is, is that, do you ever do, um, you know, dead man's float, right? And the ocean and your ears are covered by the water. And when you're looking up at the sky and you see the expansiveness of the sky and you could hear the echoes of sounds in the background, you could hear the waves and you feel this peace and you feel that you're floating and you feel like, okay, my body's here, but I'm, I'm in such a beautiful space and place mm -hmm. that I totally surrender and let go. And the more you surrender, the more you float, right? The mm -hmm. easier it is for you to float. And when you're in that space and place, you, you, are, you are hearing your own heartbeat and you're hearing the heartbeat of the universe. That's what it feels like to pass over. And TV does a really beautiful job, but that's the best way to explain it. And the more you're surrendering and the more peaceful you become, the more open you are to receive spirit and God and the voice. And you and actually heard the voice like an auditory or it was a feeling, a knowing? All of it, all of my senses. So that's what tantric actually means. Tantric means using all of your senses to connect to God, to spirit. Now, how do I do that in my everyday life? How do I bring that into the bedroom? <laughs> you know, how do I bring that into my business? How do I live that? That's actually what tantric means. I am 
using all of my senses to connect to God and spirit. And that's what awakened all of my senses as a human being. And that connection was so powerful that I was able to hear, to hear the voice of God. Christ was sitting at the edge of my bed. I don't know what Reiki is, hands-on healing. He actually put his hands on my body and was like fine tuning again, a radio station reminding myself and the pain that I've experienced and the pain of the, of the loss and the operation that it was this amazing Christ consciousness, this healing consciousness came through me. And what it did is it, the best way to explain it's like cancer. Cancer cells are all like this, okay? They're out of alignment, they're out of sync, they're out of alignment with God, they're out of alignment with your higher potential. They're creating chaos and drama. So that's what the cancers of a cell look like. Okay, and this is what Christ did. The cells went like this. This is the power of healing. So the cells are no longer chaotic and crazy. They're coming into alignment. They're talking to each other. And whatever pain or whatever there is in the body, it's slowly releasing because they're all talking to each other. It's like champagne bubbles. You know, They're all rising and speaking and vibrating. And that's what it felt like. It was like, mm, Sierra, let me remind you of who you are and what the frequency you are, who you are. And when you feel that frequency and you feel what we call purpose <laughs> and you feel that inside of you, then you're so clear because you know where you're going and what your purpose is and why you're here. And the hardest part I feel that people are having right now is depression is they can't feel that because they're not in their bodies. They're not in their senses. They're not connected to, to, to not only their body, because you have to be in your body to connect to your senses, which is creating all this friction and resistance within us. So for me, that's what hands-on healing and Reiki is. We all know those people who are in the healing industry, what are you doing? Christ was the first human being to recognize that God moved to him and through him. Now I was brought, I, I was brought up Catholic, but I converted to Judaism. I don't care what religion you are. Christ was the first human being to recognize that God moves to him and through him and he can heal with his hands. Now, working with shamans, working with different sages, they will not say Christ consciousness. They'll call it white diamond light. They'll call it anything else because it brings up religion. However, Every guru, shaman, healer is, is trying to channel the light of God, light of Christ consciousness to them and through them to help others heal. So that's what I felt. That's what I know. It's a beautiful gift that I've experienced. I came back with amazing gifts, which I already kind of had as a, a little girl, the healing, the compassion, understanding the power of my hands and tension. But this was on a whole nother level of seeing things, feeling things and helping people move through trauma. Now you felt the call though to re return to the earthly plane because I've heard a lot of people who are at that bridge it's so gorgeous and beautiful and they're so enveloped by that loving feeling. I love your description, by the way, of that underwater feeling that they don't want to return to the earthly plane. They want to follow that light. And some people come back and I've heard it's a choice. You consciously choose. It's your soul's decision what, which way you go. Did that happen to you? It did, but I didn't have a choice because I didn't want to come back. You didn't want to, but you did anyway, because, because this was my purpose. So, so my did purpose God very, tell you? Yes. My purpose was very clear. I have been rebirthed and you are here to help others become rebirthed. So meaning that I was rebirthed in the way of coming back to who I am, my true potential and spirit. And I was here to do the same, to help people rebirth themselves. For instance, the abuse, anything you've gone through, this is something that's happened to you. What happened to me with the operation? What happened to me with the abuse? This is something that's happened to you. It's not who you are at your core. 
if you continue to hear, if you continue to believe the story, the story that you make up in your mind and remain the victim, then you will always suffer. If I choose to go into that pain and what that lesson is, then I have the freedom. And that is my truth. It's the sword of truth of Christ, of God. This is the sword of truth. I'm not saying this to hurt you or harm you. And this is where victimization comes from. It's like, I'd rather stick to my story because I know the story. So thinking about the mental body, uh, my itty bitty shitty committee, as I call it. So the itty bitty shitty committee is it creates the story. And think of yourself as a woman in a cage or a trapped animal, man or a woman. And you're pacing like a lion is back and forth in the cage, but the door is open. The gate is open for you to go out, but you don't want to go out to the unknown because that's just too scary. But you like the pacing because you understand how that works. And instead of walking outside of the cage, the door is open and the freedom, which means you have to be responsible, which means you have to make choices. You'd rather stay in the cage and start decorating it. <laughs> So what do you say to all the people listening saying, I hate change, Sierra. I know what you're saying is right. I know that would be the thing to do and that's the honorable and brave thing to do, but I hate change. The ego hates change. I don't like change either. <laughs> I think, and I, you know, I look at myself and I go, dang, I've done so much work and I've done, I've come so far. However, our ego is like an elastic band. It's going to go back. Cellular memory wants to go back to what it knows. It wants to go back. The brain wants to go back to what it knows because it doesn't want to go into those spaces and places to be challenged because it brings up fear. So that's the jo brain's job is don't get yourself in a position of fear or pain. However, it paralyzes you. So you have to be strong enough to say this change is doing this with cellular memory, elastic band that I don't wanna go back there, it's too painful, but I'm gonna to have to be in those pain of growth. You know, as they say, growing pains with your business, growing pains with anything, you're going through growing pains and it will subside. And so you just have to be strong enough and not be victimized by it to move through it and go, all right, I accept the challenge. I accept the challenge. Once I accept it, it's not gonna have that much power over me. And now I'm gonna start getting tools to move forward. And that's what the four body fit method does. It's like, here's your tools, here's your tools. They work, they will put you in alignment very quickly. And it's up to you, how deep do you wanna go? How far, how far do you wanna go? How much do you wanna heal? So, so we didn't do the work, we didn't do the work. We stayed on the surface. So what you've done is you when you had this, you had this death, it wasn't even a near death, you had a death experience, you came back because you knew you had to, to help teach and share with other people being more true to their authentic self. Sure. But you still had to go on a quest for yourself to find out how you do that. And this is kind of something I love as another, um, an, a, another person on the planet that is here trying to help other people is that, you know, anybody that I think is in the business of service or trying to be in a serving profession, you know, we sacrifice ourselves because we're trying to help others. But what I love about your story is you first were wise enough to know I have to resource myself and your journey. Now you're going to correct me, please, of course. But from what I understand in my research of you, your journey really began with you trying to find your own answers for yourself. Now, a lot of women struggle, or people, I should say, mostly women nowadays, but people struggle with feeling selfish when they take care of their own needs and following what they want to do. But you, for some reason, I'd like you to tell us how you gave yourself permission to not feel like you had to be of service at that time. First, you had to resource yourself. So it was your own quest to fulfill your own needs, which then enabled you to put together the four body method, which you're going to tell us about, which now enables you to be of service. So can you explain that whole continuum to us? Yeah. Well, to me, I always thought to myself, embody, uh, empowerment is not just conceptual, it's embodiment. So I could read books, I could go to workshops, I could do all the things and say, I know it. 
which I do. I knew I worked out. I'm in, I'm in the healing business. I'm, I was a semi-professional athlete. I was a personal trainer. I know all this information. However, it was based only on the physical. And I needed to go deeper. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm part of the problem, not the solution. So you could sit there and count your calories and do all this stuff and try to reason with your emotions and all of these things that I have done in the past to reason with my pain, to keep in control. I mean, the things that I did to myself, I can't even believe, you know, just to stay in control. And I said, um, I from my near-death experience was this trauma was still in my cellular memory even though i knew it spiritually and i had my conversation with god i understood it mentally i had the knowledge emotionally i was i was connected um i was in tune with my feelings but i didn't know what to do with those feelings and how to work with those feelings and spiritually that trauma that was stored in my, in my body, physically, I had a release. Think about it. The physical body is the most dense. So any illness or disease is first showing up in the spiritual, works down to the mental, works down to the emotional, and then it shows up in the physical. The signs for me were all there. They were all there. I didn't like being pregnant. My body didn't like it. I knew it before this happened. I knew this was not my life. I used to stare in the mirror and go, who are you, Sierra? What are you doing? This is perfect. I have the perfect husband, the perfect home. I made a lot of money. I had a six and a half carat ring. I had the Mercedes at 32. I couldn't go higher. All my clients were CEO of American Express, Revlon. I I had what the all American, what everybody would ever want in their life. However, I was never happy. It was like more, more, proving your worthiness by more, more pretty, more educated, more things, more, more, more. And after this experience, it was like, oh, wow. I've got such a connection to spirit and who I am. This and everything got taken away in 24 hours. This is nothing. This is stuff. This is a dead end of depression, of kids. You know, I watched people that I worked with, clients, everybody, a dead end. Husbands cheating on their wives, kids with eating disorders, drug problems. They have everything you can imagine, but it looks great on the outside, just like me. It was a reflection of me. I looked great on the outside. I had everything, but on the inside, it was a mess. And what it did is it just turned me over. I felt like I was in the spin cycle of a washing machine, like just boom, boom, turning each turn of that chaos that we go through is like cleansing me, making me look, making me feel, go deeper, deeper, deeper. And I welcomed it because I was like, this life is more painful. I don't know what's to come, but I trust spirit to guide me. And that was a muscle that I will never, ever ever forget and it's a workout it's the hardest workout ever is to work out the spiritual body and that's when i realized that i'm ready i'm ready to go out and see the world i'm ready to go out i have no fear fear didn't exist i didn't care if i lived or died because i already did <laughs> so it was like just go for it sierra and i got on a plane to india i went and did all these things that I would never even do. And I found my, 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 I said, I'm back here, God, you put me back here. I don't like it. I was miserable. I was depressed. But until I came into my body to accept I was here physically, I was attracting all these negative things because I was a light bulb shining. And it was like, and it's like, when you see a light bulb, all the bugs that are coming to it, it was because I wasn't grounded to protect myself and I wasn't grounded in my body to, to understand boundaries, to say, oh, this is not worthy of me. Love, again, is not just an emotion. It's the most powerful force grounded by action and responsibility. Sierra, you have to come fully present in your body to love yourself. And when you are fully present in your body to love yourself, you have permission to protect yourself. 
So as women, we're not taught that. We're taught, oh, here, just take everything. Oh, I'm supposed to be of service to everyone else. That's when I got it. Like in order for me to survive here, I have to love myself that much to protect myself. That was like, whoa, I felt it. Like just, I just got aligned and sunk in and said, I'm taking this challenge because if not, I'm going down, I'm suffering. It's too much, it's too much pain. And then that's when I realized that all the conditioning that I was taught as a woman gives my power away and I'm not doing it any longer. And I don't care who challenges me because I know what God is and I know what love is in the highest form. And this is what I was taught love was conditionally from my environment, culture, my family, but this is codependency. This is not love. This is not the intelligence of love. This is harmful. This is destructive. This is not only harming me, but the next generations. And I refuse to play a part in it. And when you accept that, then you love yourself so much. You don't play the role that other people want you to play. Be the good wife, be the good girl, be the good daughter, be the leader, take on their stuff. Just I'm like, no, that's not my stuff. That's not my shit. Excuse my language as I say, Jersey girl. That's not my shit. It's not my stuff and that's not my job. My job is to help hold space for you. My job is to you know, maybe give you some encouragement but my job is not to get on the front line with you and be of service to you. My job is to teach you how to survive. My job is to teach you how to be present in your body. My job is to teach you how to do that, not only for yourself, but for the next generation. And we haven't been taught that as women. We've been taught, no, oh, you know, just give it all away. Be the good girl. Yes. Imitation man. Grow up like a guy with a man give all your power away so you went from one extreme to the other okay so where's the balance you know as we talked about the masculine and the feminine energy where's the balance so i say goddess warrior so i coined that term because that's what came through when i passed over is sierra you're so in tuned with the masculine aspects of the warrior part because you had to survive but you had to disconnect from your feminine side and the goddess part of who you are in order to survive. And let's not forget the word goddess has the word God in it. And goddess is actually means, it's Latin for diva. And what happened to the word diva? Oh, high maintenance. But it actually means a woman who has the ability to channel the light of God to her and through her, through her eyes, through her voice, through her words, through her hands, through her body. She is she is this intelligence of love in physical form. And so that's when I realized that I gave, God gave me permission. I gave myself permission to own all that power, to own all that beauty, to own all that knowledge, and that I am a force of nature. And I'm here for a reason, and I'm owning it. And what comes at me, it's not my shit. And I hate this, right? But, you know, it's, it's the survival Jersey girl too. the part of that's not my stuff. And I'm not going to tone myself down or turn myself off because I have to fit something that you want me to be for your needs. <sighs> Mic <That's> drop. <laughs> wow. Mic drop. I just have to say, boom. <laughs> uh, wow. Sierra. I just have to say you're like a superhero. I mean, how, what do you say to the regular woman who didn't have the near-death experience to have such a strong, visceral, experiential conviction, connection to that source, to that message? Um, you know, most of us didn't have that experience. Not that it was a good thing, but in this regard, it did become a good thing because look how strong and what a force you are. I mean, what do you say to those of us that don't have that to draw from for the conviction? But you do have it. That's what I teach. You do have it. I went through it personally only because it was part of my karma and because, you know, I had to go through that pain 
because my ego again was so strong that I wasn't listening. And so now it's about teaching women to listen, listen to their intuition. I've always had it as a child. You have it as a child. But the pain that I went through took me so far out of alignment. It had to take a bigger pain in order to wake me up. Did you go through a period of anger? Anger at what? God? Well, no, at uh, people who took it away and like the abuse that you suffered. And then, you know, did you and, and even organize religion telling you you got to go through us to connect with God and this is the way. And did you ever go through a period? You've mentioned right, righteous anger, but a period of, of literally being angry, like, you know, you took that from me or at all. Well, it was funny because, you know, people asked me how did I start my business and excuse me, but I was like, I was fucking pissed off <laughs> how women were being used and abused. That was my righteous anger. Since I came back after my experience, I thought I was crazy sometimes. I thought like, what is going on with me? And I thought, okay, wait a second. My righteous anger is now to fight the systems. So I fought the systems. So law. I fought. I actually went to trial and won. I went through a 30 day trial because of this pregnancy should have never happened the way that it did. It was written. It was in all the paperwork. They tried to deny it. I went to trial. It was very interesting. I felt like I was a witch on the stand because they were blaming the way that I looked, that I had multiple affairs. And that's the way how I got the tubular pregnancy was because it was pelvic inflammation disease. I was like, okay, this is really interesting. Oh yeah, it was horrific. It was absolutely horrific. I'm like, are we in the 21st mm -hmm. century? What's wow. going on? But you know, that's a whole nother story. But spirit, spirit was behind me. The first, just to give you a short synapse of the pain. So this was my righteous anger is fighting against the medical system. Law. How we are so, so conditioned to give our power away and how women are abused and used in the systems. And I'm like, not on my watch. So I, it was about my self love about fighting for myself that I have a voice and what happened to me is not acceptable and it's happening to other women. So what can I do about it? Mm. What can I do about it? I have a voice. I asserted my rights. I asserted my voice and I took my power back. So basically what happened was, and it just happened on November 19th, which is very interesting. I, I won my trial. The doctor, I was affiliated with a, a midwife center and a doctor. And the midwife center kept saying, oh, we saw her. We did it, because um, they did, they did a, a software on me. But the doctor was supposed to read it and the doctor never did. And so, um, when I had the sonogram done, you know, they were all the way over to the left side of my leg because that's where it exploded on the left side and left tube. I said, what are you doing all the way over there? You know, I know anatomy and physiology because, oh, no, 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 the baby. And then we heard the baby. We saw the baby. We saw the heartbeat. We saw everything. And I was four months pregnant. And they're like, well, go home. And then you're going to come back for another sonogram. And I was like, something's not right. Even my dog knew she wouldn't come near me. And what happened was when my uterus ruptured and I went to the hospital, the doctor who I first went to, who I didn't really like because he wasn't holistic, was the doctor who saved my life. He was there doing rounds. They had to take me to the nearest hospital in Ridgewood, New Jersey. And they couldn't take me to the hospital that I was, I was going to give birth in with the midwife. They had to take me to the closest hospital. They took me there and there was no doctor. And they said, well, who's your doctor? And I'm like, it's not this hospital. Mind you, I can't even talk. But what happened was, is the doctor who I first saw was there doing his rounds on Christmas Eve. Like, what are the odds of that? And this man saved my life because he was a Vietnam vet doctor who was quick on the field. And they wanted to take out my whole uterus. And he said, no, she's too young. So he sewed it back together. He took my uterus out of my body and then sewed it back together and put it back into my body. Now, cellular memory, every time Christmas would happen, I would feel that operation. Oh. Like, it's like amazing how the body works. Now, 20 something years, like, 
20 something years later, I don't feel that anymore because I've done the work on the cellular memory. However, this man who saved my life, like what are the odds? What are the odds of that? Like the coincidences, the synchronicities of certain things that have happened. Like you can't make that up. And so when I was in court for my trial and I knew, and this was the part of conversations that I had with attorneys, we're gonna take your case because it should have never gone that far. So I had to get every six months, I had to get um, blood tests for HIV was at that time. So that was a lot of stress on me, a lot of stress on my marriage. I knew I wasn't gonna be married to my husband any longer. God told me I wasn't. But the point of this is that as I was going through it and I came through, it was this doctor saves my life. I'm now in trial to fight against the law, to fight against medicine. So I'm speaking to these attorneys. They say, yes, yeah, we'll take your case. Six months later, they call me into the office. It was like they all had the same script. Well, Sierra, we have this client, you know, we sewed the sponge into their knee and you sign off at a doctor. You can't sue a doctor. I'm like, I'm not suing a doctor. I'm suing a midwife center that's affiliated with a doctor. I never saw a doctor. That was the point. So, well, we have this case and, you know, we sewed the sponge into the, the doctor sewed the sponge into the client's knee, uh, knee and they got an infection, but they can't sue if you sign off a liability. You could die you know, operation, what have you. And I said, okay. So I said to the, I said to the attorney, and this is my mouth, because I went to three huge attorneys and they all came back with the same story. We'll take it, but no, we can't. You survive, you lived. I said, excuse me. So if I wanted to get in vitro at the time, it would cost $30,000 a pop. My body has been damaged. The therapy, you know, whatever, you know, the stress that I went through, the trauma it put on my marriage. You know, I knew all that. I wasn't going to be married to my husband or whatever, but it was the part of the justice. The spirit also was showing me, you have to fight for justice, right? So the justice is self-love. The anger, the fight, why we are so scared as women to fight. So I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen, but this isn't going to happen on my watch. And I just know I have to fight. Whether I win or lose, it doesn't matter. I'm going in to fight. And what ended up happening was, is I'd go to these well-known attorneys and they proceed to tell me a story always. And I said, okay, here's the story. Sierra, you can't take your case because you survived. You have a small percentage of getting pregnant. I'm like, no, my uterus would rupture. So they were making excuses to get out of the lawsuit. And the reason being was, is because there wasn't enough money in it. One. Two, I said, okay, so I'm getting smart on this. So I said, okay, so can I ask you a question? I said, if my finger was cut off by an accident, whomever, can I sue? Yes, of course, because you're missing a part of your body. Okay. But you're telling me I can't, I can't sue for what happened to me because it's all my paperwork. It should have never gone this far. Yes, I had a tubular pregnancy. Yes, I would have lost the baby, but my uterus wouldn't have ruptured. The damage that was done even for me to have children again and HIV. So you're telling me I have no rights. No, you have none. You can't, you're not gonna win. And I was like, wow, okay. Because you're alive. Basically that's it, because I'm alive. I said, oh, okay. But let me ask you a question. I said, sir. And, you know, there's all a bunch of men around the table, the conference table, because, you know, this guy knows he can't tell me one on one. And it's like this whole control trip. And it's actually called male herding. Yeah, called intimidation. Sure, male herding, the intimidation, you know, the control. And I was like, okay, so I could see if my finger got cut off. I said, so wait a second. I said, because my uterus is inside and because it's internal and women give birth every day and some die because of the birthing experience because mine's internal. I don't have the right to sue. Number one, I said, number two, if one of your testicles got cut off because it's external and now it's lowering your, 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 your chances because your sperm count is lower, do you have the right to sue? Because it's something external. 
I said, gentlemen, please, I'm not an idiot. This is about you not making enough money. This is about justice for me. It's not about the money. It's about what has happened and other women are going through this. So shame on you. And I just left them. I went through that three times. I was like, so you mean to tell me somebody could sue for burnt coffee on your lap? $4 million, two case in McDonald's yeah. for, because they can get money for it. So then another attorney tells me this story about the same thing, calls me into the office. This is well, Samira, six months later. I'm like, I did all this research. We can't take the case. He goes, well, here's a case that I have. I have this young woman who fed honey to her newborn baby and the baby died. Now that's a case. I said, are you son of a bitch? <laughs> and no holds bar with this mouth. I was like, are you kidding me? So you're gonna sit there and tell me because of this young girl who fed her baby honey by accident, because honey is good for babies, but not for newborns because of the bacteria. The baby ended up dying and she's a young mother. And now you're gonna benefit millions of dollars because that's why they now have on a honey label, don't feed it to newborns. Millions of dollars because of what you have, because of what this young girl has done. Like, you disgust me. Disgusting. So I was like, okay, I understand there's not enough money in it for, for whomever. So it wasn't about justice, but the part of it was, was fighting for my rights, fighting for my body as a woman. My, my body is not just a baby machine. And my body is not just for medicine. My body is not for other people's pleasure. This is my body. This is my container and I have to fight for it. And so that's also part of my purpose, which kept showing up in my life over and over again. And even when I was younger, I was sexually assaulted by a doctor and I went to the medical board, reported it, went to the police, went to the state, went to, and it helped create the law in New Jersey that a third party needs to be present in a doctor's office. Wow. Wow, so, Sierra. So the women's empowerment that I think of or what I know of is stepping up to the plate. You have to fight. You have to claim your space. You have to assert your rights. You have to use your voice and claim your own femininity and understand what the worth of that feminine and energy that you have. What is it worth? What is it worth? You have to put a worth on it. So how do we do that without being like, for lack of a better term, kind of pissed off, angry women? Like, how do we do that and still love men and appreciate men and get along with men and others for that matter? Like, how do we do that, but keep our softness and keep our, you know what I mean? How, how do we actually do that without having that, that edge? You know what I mean? Someone's like just angry. Okay, first of all, anger is a very healthy emotion. It depends on how you use it. Anger actually sets a boundary. As you can hear in the tone of my voice, I'm angry, but it's a healthy angry. It's an anger that's stating the truth. It's not an anger to offend anyone or hurt anyone. It's a deep rooted anger and it's not explosive. It's an anger that's a righteous anger that says this is where I put my energy and I focused it to create change. And a boundary was crossed. Yes. And so that has to do with your body language, your tone of voice, whatever. So now the compassionate side is really understanding when you say, I don't want to hate men or I don't want to dislike men. First of all, you have to be healthy in your own masculine energy before you could be healthy with any man. And you have to, what does that mean? Okay. So my own ma masculine energy, my masculine energy when I ask women, what is your definition of masculine and feminine? It's very interesting. The answers. So when I say, what's, what's masculine to you? Domineering, controlling, no. Those are experiences you've had with men. Masculine means effort, action, movement, linear, intelligent, redefined because those answers are creating your reality. Domineering, controlling. So why do you, that's why you keep repeating men who are like that. And you're also not healthy in those aspects of the masculine energy within yourself. You don't know how to 
do that. You don't, you don't use that in a healthy way. You use it in an unhealthy way, unhealthy way. So you blame men for everything that goes wrong in your life because, oh, I've been conditioned to do this and that victim, victim. So when I'm healthy in both aspects of myself, then I attract that. Now, yes, we have to learn lessons. That's what relationships are for. You, you go through karma two ways, through relationships with partners, your children, family members, and you also go through two by fours over the head like me. That's just karma. We're all going to go through the same gamut of emotions and same. It's just how are you handling it? And then when I say feminine, what's the definition of feminine? Sweet, pretty, kind, compassionate. I'm like, oh, adjectives, okay? So when I say what is feminine? Open, receptive, allowing, intuitive, emotionally intelligent, stillness, silence. Everything first starts off with the feminine energy and then goes into the masculine. So if I don't know how to be still and silent to listen to my intuition or my emotions, which is part of being feminine and a woman, well, then I'm overreactive. I'm angry to the extent where it's not healthy and I'm victimized because it's just like, I'm not taking responsibility for my own femininity. I'm projecting because I'm just part of the circle of chaos and drama. So when I understand the worth of my femininity and knowing how that works, well, then I know how to put that feminine energy into action, which is now the masculine. So I always say a true goddess warrior listens to her intuition and then is brave enough to follow it. Spirit's working to you and through you. And if you're not brave enough to follow or you, you can't even be still or silent, then what are you doing? You're, you're burning yourself out, trying to prove your worthiness by how pretty you are, how smart you are, how much money you make. You're an imitation man. So you will never, ever attract a healthy man because you disconnected from your femininity in order to survive. So now you have male energy against male energy. You think a man wants male energy against male energy? Or you say the same thing with men, why they're so unhealthy. They're not even in tune with their emotions or their feminine aspects of themselves. So now that's what we're up against with women because our society is not holding men accountable. Hmm. So if we can't do it for ourselves, how do you think a man's going to do it? Because that's what the goddess energy does. It helps men come into alignment. We are the antenna. And men come from respect first before they come from love. So if you don't respect yourself, they're not going to respect you. Once they have respect, then there's love. Women do it backwards. We do it, yeah. we do it the other way. Oh, I'll give you all of me. Love, love. And you... Now they don't respect you because you have no boundaries. A woman who has boundaries is harder to get that hunt. So, ooh, he likes it. He likes, he likes the boundaries because it teaches him where he stands. He likes the boundaries because it's very primal. It's very instinctual. He likes the boundaries because it's a, like a turn on actually, because it's about respect. And he also knows you're not, you're not just somebody that's just going to walk all over you. Ooh, I, I like this little fight in her. I like this primal part of her because he can see that masculine, healthy energy in you as he sees it himself. So much gold in that. Just so much wisdom. Everybody's going to have to rewind and listen to this again and again and again. You just said so much there, Sierra. Um, what would you say to the woman, though, or the person that wants to develop this feminine sense of themselves better and go into their feelings to be silent, be still, go within, get to know themselves better, connect with that source of power, but truly is afraid of what they're going to find there or doesn't know what to do with the feelings because the feelings are bad, they're uncomfortable, or they know it means they're going to make them aware of a change they probably need to make in, them, in their lives, whether it be a relationship, a job, a situation. And that just whole thing makes them feel uncomfortable. They're not resourced to deal with what they're going to find there. What would you say to that person that's keeping them at bay because they don't feel resourced to deal with them? Good question. Um... So here I'm going to show my compassionate side, the feminine side of that answer. Okay. So again, this is something that's happened to you. You've been conditioned to do, to 
to you've been conditioned to give your power away. So the pain, trauma means, the way I define trauma is anytime you went out of your body in an uncomfortable situation in order to survive it. That could be an overbearing parent, the child has asthma. That could be your first sexual experience. It wasn't very fun. Your first experience in the gynecologist's office, your first experience with your father, a man that's supposed to love and protect you um, and abuses you. That could be that could be a car accident. That could be grief, loss of a pain. Whatever it is, emotions are just energy and movement. That's what emotions means. Okay. Energy and movement. Once I validate an emotion, then it moves. If I keep running away from the emotion, then all I'm doing is creating more pain. And so you have to have compassion for yourself. And part of being a woman is owning your emotions. It's, it's, it's not easy. It's easier for us because we have more synapses in the brain and we're able, to, we have more emotional intelligence. But if you give that part of yourself away, you know, it's okay to cry. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to take care of yourself and take that space. If you don't do that for yourself, then that's why you're suffering. And that's why the pain continually keeps growing and expanding. And we get so caught up and overwhelmed by it. And I can say this all the time to women. I'm like, the ego wants to make your pain seem 10,000 times worse than it is. However, if I allow myself to stop and listen and feel to that emotion and feel it, just feel and cry and feel vulnerable and don't get your head into it. Like, why am I feeling this way? You know, Judge it. just let it flow. Just let it flow and go. The stronger you teach yourself to do that, because it's a muscle, it's an emotional muscle. I used to time myself and I used to go, Sierra, you got 15 minutes, cry. Cry, cry. You're allowed to cry for 15 minutes. Like I talked to my ego. I mean, like, okay, that really hurt. Now give yourself permission to stop and cry. Now I'm gonna give you 15 minutes to do that. Because if you go past 15 minutes and you sit in it for hours and days, now you're going into depression, okay? So I'm gonna train myself and it may sound cruel or mean or whatever it is, but I'm training my ego, my higher self. That's what I'm doing. I'm not allowing my ego to go deep into the hole of depression, into the victimization. I'm feeling this one emotion. I'm going to let it percolate and I'm going to let it come out. Good. Okay. I feel so much better. Now, some of us don't know how to feel. So literally put on a movie that's going to make you cry. That's what I used to have to do. I was so desensitized. I was so desensitized to suck it up all the time. You know how you watch a movie or commercial, you're like, oh, can't cry. I remember saying at times, I don't remember the last time I cried. And it was yeah. like, that's not such a good thing. <laughs> no, last night I did a full moon ceremony and I cried and I cried and I cried because I knew I was so proud of myself, like tears of joy for doing the work and I'm back here. But then I was crying because of, of what I've lost, you know, mm -hmm. giving up, you know, spirit's always testing you. You have to give up what you love the most or what you think is love. So I lost my job, you know, I lost my four body fit institute, my whole savings, my whole everything. I'm like, wow, what is this showing me? I lost a marriage. My husband got prostate cancer a year and after my marriage. I'm like, are you oh. kidding? Oh my like, gosh. You, how many sledgehammers do I have to get over that? Right. And I'm like, I've done so much work and I just cried to relieve the pressure, but this mm -hmm. is what I'm strong enough. And this is the muscle it taught me. I always go back to the seed of where I was when I first started anything. So when I first met my husband, I was 50 years old, the fear being 50 single. But I also was of service for all these years. And I'm like, all these women go home to their husbands and their partners. And, and I go home to a cat and a dog. I deserve, I want love now in my life. And same spot, 
my career was changing because I didn't want to do what I was doing any longer. It was hurting my body at 50, being on the front line, you know, how much rape and abuse and things that I deal with. And I'm like, I don't advertise that. I advertise boot camp for goddesses, women's empowerment. But behind that is always abuse. Yes. Yeah. The abuse is rising. And a lot of the women don't even want to, they don't even believe it. They don't believe that I'm like, these are the statistics and the statistics lie because in all of my measurements of the four body fit method, every time women gathered, 60% of them were a statistic of sexual assault and abuse. That's not including eating disorders, drugs, alcoholic, workaholic. That's not including any of that. That's just including, okay. So each woman is suffering and how are we picking our drug? We go into bad relationships. We become a workaholic, which is the imitation man. I'm going to you know, just prove my worthiness by this. I'm gonna, yeah, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to um, be a shopaholic, uh, a beautyaholic, uh, you know, however you've learned how to survive, to think what feminine means and how you manipulate that femininity to get what you want on it is your drug. Xanax, wine. It's also, it's also your God. And so that's where we have to own, where we give our power away. And that's what I noticed with my measurements of where, wow, these women are smart. They're beautiful. They're educated. These are all women from Kripalu and Omega, mind you. You know, it's, it's not cheap to go there. Mm -hmm. And all the workshops that I've done over the years and measure them. Now, these are conscious women. Yeah. Can you imagine unconscious like I worked with women in Harlem young girls from tr sex trafficking to the worst horrific circumstances even in Harvard and all these young women who are so smart so beautiful so educated yeah. the only way they know how to survive is to cut off their femininity and I'm like these are our future leaders and this is the way they treat themselves and this is what they're doing this is pretty scary this is very scary so, so, t so tell us about now where you want to take your work, given that and your vast 30 year career of history and speaking all over the world, international bestseller, and you had your own institute, you've lectured to hundreds of thousands of people. Seeing what you see now, where are you going with your work? Good question. I'm kind of right back to where I started. That's the sad part for me because I'm bored, but it's going back to the basics of the four body fit method and back to the basics of getting people into bodies and you can't do anything. You cannot heal until you get into that space or place. And I don't care what it's out there. You could take as many courses as you want. Everybody wants more and more and more, but if you're not working what the tools, the basic tools you have, you're not going anywhere. Again, cellular memory is like an elastic band. So my work has always been about truth. My work's always been about the goddess warrior getting on the front line and doing your work, holding you accountable, because that is love. Love to me is holding you accountable to be the best version of yourself. And let me help you get rid of what you've been conditioned to do to give your power away. And the women heal at an accelerated rate. And then what they realize is, is that, wow, I'm giving myself permission to be all that. Yeah, you are, because that's what you're here for. And stop so, and making excuses and stop, stop being the victim. And I help them understand where they're being victimized. Okay, so someone's like, sign me up. What is she talking about? I want to learn her method. Tell, tell us how we find out how to get more of you and learn these techniques. Well, I have the 13 levels of empowerment for women warriors. So which is, a, which is a course or a book? It's an online program. So okay. at, the end, at the end of my book, Goddess to the Core, I wrote these 13 levels of empowerment for women warriors which is right here for those watching on YouTube. It's right here. Yeah, my original book, look at this, it's beat up. I got the original too. It's 2010. I, yep, yep, I think mine's nine. It wasn't the first edition, 2009? Yeah. Uh-huh, yep. Mine's all, 
marked up. The one I always use in my workshops. So it's dear to me. So much um, gold in there. Everyone, this is required reading if you are interested in ex accessing and integrating more of your whole self tapping into everything Sierra's talking. You just you've got to get this book. It is a steal for what, 25 bucks? It is probably your life's work. It is so practical. It, it, she goes into the four bodies. She goes into what she learned. She goes into the history of women, womanhood. It is a manual for how to be a fully self-actualized, self-embodied woman. And I know you're coming up with another book. Tell us about that. And, yep. Well, I just did the 13 levels of empowerment for women warriors online, which has the book. Okay, that's the course. Yep. Like, I'm working on my another book, which is really about the intelligence of love. It's more about the four body fit method because the method, the book is the method, but the method will be clinically reached until after the book. Oh, say that, say that, say that, say that again. I just, I lost you. What did you say about? Brought us to the core is based on the four bodies and the four yep. questions that we asked. And mm -hmm. what are the muscles of the four bodies and how do they talk to each other? So we all talk about the four bodies. It created the four body fit trend, it created the four body trend. Yeah. And um, so mind you, I was doing the boot camps prior to the book. So I was doing boot camp in 1996, which which was my four body fit method. And then the book didn't come out until 2009. Mm -hmm. so I've been doing this method, the goddess warrior and the four body fit since 1995 after my near death experience. And so now I'm gonna go deeper into the actual um, story, my story, what happened when I passed over and the stories of the things that I've gone through um, and the intelligence of love. What is it? What is it scientifically, medically, indigenously? Law. How, is lo how does love come into law? Ooh. How does love come into science and medicine? Oh yeah, because the abuse of power actually comes from, you know, when we think about what is love, again, love is not just an emotion. It's the most powerful force grounded by action and responsibility. How does love come into, like domestic violence is so high. Think about it. Mm. What is the intelligence of love and law? I'd say it doesn't even exist <laughs> because separation of church and state, right? I mean, uh, you know, there's that saying that our, the priests of today are our scientists. And they're the ones who set the law and set, you know, but every, there is no, there is no such thing as being objective in science because we are involved in it and we're affecting it. So, you know, where does, where does the absolute reality begin and perceived reality end? And that line is blurred. And where does love come into the equation as something because we can't touch it, taste it, feel it? Is it, is it less powerful nevertheless? You know, but it's it's just as real. And like you said, it's the most powerful force. So how do we how do we rectify that? Well, love and law to me, domestic violence is the separation of women. It's divide and conquer. If I love myself, that can't be that can't happen. Number one. Number two, love and law. When you think about love and law, why why the laws are created to actually not support or protect women you got to think about the law does not so much protect it responds to crime mm. so like what happened with me with sexual assault and abuse i loved myself so much that i studied my rights i knew what they are i loved myself so much even though i was up against the system which was the male herding in the patriarchal system that my love, that force of love to take responsibility and know what my rights are, forced that law to change. So now what does it do? It actually teaches love, again, it's not just an emotion, it's the most powerful force grounded by action responsibility. Where are you taking responsibility to love yourself to create the change? That's an intelligence. Love is an intelligence and there's different degrees of that intelligence. 
So how does love show up in religion? Well, do you think it's love that when a woman is even in my in my uh, book, I talk about the innate uh, innate anger in every woman, the righteous anger. My step grandfather was an ex priest, and he gave me all the scriptures of every religion and spiritual practice that takes out the divine feminine, that women women are not equal to. Even the Buddhists believe if you were born a female, it was considered bad karma. The Buddhists. Yes. Yep. You really do your research, and this is what I've done, the research. How does love show up in religion? How is love disempowered? Well, there you go, right there. Every single scripture. And a woman is not considered equal. So yes. for me, love is the intelligence that says, I am equal, and let me show you how I'm equal, and let me show you why I'm equal. I'm not trying to prove my worthiness to you because that means I'm competing with you. I understand what my worth is and this no longer works for me. So we have to go deep enough to look into our religion, our practices, what are we following? Why, you know, the four body fit method always asks the question, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And how it's affecting you? If you can't answer that, then you're a victim. I love it. And you don't have sovereignty. So, wow. All right. So uh, there's just so much there. It's just such great stuff. I just, I just love it. Uh, you can tell I've been like, like really going through all this. Stopping at the bit, but, but you know what? It's time. It's time. I mean, we're at the age of Aquarius and it's, you know, mother earth is speaking loud and clear. And, um, you know, I think we're at the dawn of this era of people ready to hear your message and, ready to look under the covers and to consider another way and encompass all of it and stop being so quick to point and blame and judge and feel put upon, but rather, you know, taking our own power back and in integrating all of who we are without blaming ourselves and, 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 um, but being accountable to ourselves. I love how, and I'll just say, say to the people listening, if you, ever have opportunity to meet Sierra in person, you will be astounded by her true sense of power and presence. This is a woman who's very self-contained and she is a force. You, she it is palatable when you are around her. That is unusual. That is very unusual for women, if not people in this day and age. Um, but please watch this on my YouTube channel because you will be amazed at her striking physical beauty. This is a woman that's coming up to 60 years old, and I know I have permission to see that. Just sit down when you look because she looks probably 30, and she is a force to be reckoned with. And But I feel like time is right for what you have to offer, Sierra, that the world is looking for embodied people who have walked the talk, who have paid their dues, who have done the work to use your terms and really are the yin and the yang. And they have the wisdom and now they're the wise elders, if you will, to teach us that there is another way to be. There is a better way to be. There's a way that works better and can be a great role model. So if I was listening to the show and had new younger women, I would direct them to your online course, even if they're older women, who cares? Whoever needs this message. Um, but to me, I'm so grateful that there are people like you on the planet because I can say as a woman growing up, you and I have talked that we have had very similar paths in our the history of abuse and the history of getting being very connected as a child and getting pulled away from that by organized religion and people, well-meaning people who might have had good intentions, but nevertheless kind of screwed it up for us a little bit. Um, and then kind of went into their masculine, you know, really downplayed their feminine out of self-protection and trying to do the right thing, but now have, thank God, lived long enough to have the opportunity to come full circle to now go back and integrate all of who I am. But for me, you are such a wonderful role model because I don't feel like there's a lot of women that are very grounded in their masculine, all those beautiful, wonderful qualities of the masculine, yet fully feminine. 
and it's it's a breath of fresh air. I'm grateful oh, for you. Thank you for having me, and it's a great conversation and going on and on, and it was just amazing. So it's just really thank you for creating the space for this, and uh, we all need a little push, you know, and uh, and you're amazing. You've been. <laughs> part of my life for a long time and we always just kind of weave back and in and out and you know we all need each other right now for that and you know I always look at love the other thing of love is is um it's like an eagle pushing its baby out of the nest to fly you know you have to give that person the tools and then test them push them you know it's a, a very native way I am native it's like they don't talk about your emotions you work through them through your body you know, you, you do different ceremonies and everything that's stored is here in your body. And how do I keep that body healthy and the container healthy? Because if the container is not healthy, spirit doesn't want to stay and do its work. That's right. And it can't because it, it just can't. It's not resonating at a high enough frequency to be light, to move the energy. Yeah. It gets too, too stuck in matter. And that's why, like you, my origins in my career was in the physical fitness. I was, a, as you, a personal trainer, an aerobics instructor back in the Jane Fonda 80s leotard days, you know, that was me, you know, and I went through the physical and I, I know that, you know, in, in ancient cultures and in indigenous cultures, they go through the spiritual first, but we kind of go through the physical. Either way, as long as we get there, I guess at the end of the day, uh, I don't know if one way is better than the other, but I've now learned that, wow, particularly as you get older, you know, you can't sustain the physical without the other bodies, without getting your emotions in line, without pulling your spirit into the game and without addressing your mind and the way your mind works. There's just no way. And God knows it's not going to be any fun unless you do, you know, otherwise you're just going to be sacrificing and no fun to be around and, you know, not indulge in anything in life. And you really need to incorporate all of it to sustain it and have a fulfilled, happy life. And that's what getting older has really taught me is and to stop apologizing too, by the way, for your needs, you know, and you're really great about that. And, and, and back to my show, Aphrodite was really great about that. She did not apologize for her needs. And I know I, as a woman, had always apologized and if not downplayed my own needs because I thought it was the right thing to do. You know, as women were taught to sacrifice and take care of others and, you know, we come second. So you've been a great role model and continue to be for us to know how to do, fill our own needs with love and others' needs with love, but not at the expense of our own needs. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Which we need more of, my friend. So I really hope you come back to our show and speak to us more about the four body method and the, the five pages of notes that I had to ask you. I have so many more questions to tap into your knowledge. So will you please come back on the show? Yes, I would love to. And thank you for having me. And I hope, you know, my prayer is always may my eyes, ears, and heart be open to receive you, a oh, great spirit. May the words be yours. May I get out of the way. And that was my prayer when I first started speaking. So hopefully it kind of, you know, as I call it, the sifting process kind of cracked open a little bit of that emotional armor and the ego to like really hear, hear. So much wisdom in that. I love the get out of the way part. So true. So, so true. Sierra, can you just tell us one last time how people can find you? Tell us your social media, your website, and any books and courses that you want to mention as we close. Sure, thank you. On my website, sierrabender.com or fourbodyfitinstitute.com. And I have, well, the goddess to the core is the book that started everything. I have the 13 levels of empowerment for women warriors online training program so it's 13 weeks so 13 you know what is 13 is a very sacred number to the divine feminine and i created these 13 levels of empowerment to remind me if i knew as a woman when i was giving my power away right 
was like, wow, I don't know when I'm giving my power away because I didn't really know what my power was. So then it was like, if you abide by these 13 levels, then you know you're giving your power away and you're not a goddess standing in her core. Brilliant. So those 13, yeah, so each one of them is an order, specific order. And you you do want to eat and you have hormones, so you have to body it. So there's exercises in there for all four bodies, following four body fit method. Then I'm gonna be having the four body fit workouts coming out online. So for COVID, I donated twice a week all of my classes just to help women stay in their body and emotionally handle what was going on with kids at home and husbands and all this stuff. So they loved it. So I'm like. Okay, so I'm going to do the four body fit workouts. And that's it for right now. I'm working on writing. That's a show. it. That's it, huh? That's it. <laughs> I'm working on a lot of things. Spirits yeah. like download. So for me, COVID was, has been about downloading, listening, creating, shifting, you know, alignment again. Receptive, we being receptive. Crazy. It's a, you know, as the natives say, I'm on an inner vision quest right now. Let's just stop, look, listen, feel, be still and silent. Listen, listen. Mm -hmm. And that's very hard when you had so much emotions that you haven't dealt with your work. And that's why I have compassion for it right now for those people who are really going through a lot of depression and the kids, the teenagers, and just they need that stimulation. And it's very hard. It's very hard but it's giving us the opportunity to go deep enough to heal at such an accelerated level right now. So if you really wanna heal, you could heal at a very accelerated rate if you're willing to get into alignment. And instead of dragging it out, it's like, boom, it's happening now, now. I, you know, I agree. I, I, a lot of my students would say something, well, I heard it takes you know three weeks to develop a habit or whatever. I'm like, no, it takes one second. It takes a determined, con committed decision. That's it. Like I look at it like the Band-Aid, just rip it off and do it. That's the way I operate and that's what works for me. The little bits and you know, it, that doesn't work. I don't know. It's like you do need to have some some gumption behind you and some 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 mental strength of like, you know what, damn it, do it and just don't that's how you get self-respect is you don't go back on your word to yourself. I mean, it doesn't mean being perfect. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm not perfect, but you know, it's like, you know what, I'm going to do this because I said, I'm going to do this. And that means I'm going to do it. That's yeah. That's hard. Cause when you got the itty bitty shitty committee in your head, but like you said, the first thing is the feminine energy. Everything first starts with the feminine. I have to make a commitment to myself. Mm. Once I make commitment, then I have the discipline, which is the masculine. If I commit to myself, then the discipline will follow. But if I can't commit to myself, this is why most people fail because they try to force the discipline and then they can't because it's ego driven. But if I love myself enough to make the commitment, I will be disciplined enough to do it. And you take the pressure off of failure because you're gonna fail. You measure your success, how fast you get back into alignment. And that's ah, part, I like that. That's part of the cellular memory. Like, oh, wow, the old me would have cried for six months because of my boyfriend or whatever happened. Now it's like, oh, get over it. You know, two weeks. All right, I'm over. I got it. I got the lesson. Move on. Although some tears may still percolate up, I got it. But I'm not going to sit in it and I'm not going to punish myself. And that's what the intelligence of love is. And then each time you get back a little faster, right? Yep. It's a little bit faster, a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Now you recognize when you're out of alignment because you don't want the two by four over the head. You're like, get back in alignment because now yep. the red flags are and your higher self is stronger. So I always work from the spiritual down to the physical because the spiritual body is the first body that recognizes what love is and my coming from faith or fear. Then it talks to the mental, then it, right? So mm. how I how I feel, how I feel is how I behave, how I behave is what I will manifest. So when I'm able to observe my thoughts and change my thoughts three times a day, oh my God, you change your whole outcome. And then emotionally, right? There's an emotional response. So am I going to act or react to this? If I act, 
then I build a stronger emotional body and I'm not reacting because I know what boundaries are. That's not my stuff. I know that it's okay for me to take care of me. I know that that's not my stuff. I don't need to get in there and solve it for them. That codependency that we have as women. Mm -hmm. You allow them to sit in their own stuff and you hold space for them through prayer, giving them some wisdom or give them a little push, but you're not going to get in there with them. And then physically, you know, you understand that everything I've done spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and then physically is what I'll manifest in my life. And Beautiful. you manifest quicker like this. And you don't yes. take it personally. Like, you know, do I, do I scream and yell at God? Well, I just got married. I've been single for 18 years. I finally find the man of my dreams and he gets prostate cancer in the first year. Do I scream and yell at God and play victim? No. All right. What's the lesson in this? What's the lesson in this? What was the lesson? Huh. Still, Still working it out? Me? Yeah, that, that's brutal. <laughs> I, knew. I knew exactly what it was. I prayed that I have an amazing man in my life. I've had amazing men in my life. However, what I didn't pray for, for what I didn't ask for, because I'm in the spiritual business, is somebody who's spiritual. Because all the men that I've seen most, not all, in this arena, they abuse power. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that because I haven't seen something outside of that. Because most women who do spiritual work most people who do spiritual work are women. So they have these male leaders, but these male leaders, it's just another abuse of power, whether it's in a church, whether it's, you know, ceremonial, native, whatever you want to call it. It's all around us. It's all around us. And I didn't ask for someone who was spiritually connected. So when he got the prostate cancer and when we were going through intimacy issues, he couldn't do the work. He didn't want to do the work. So I said, I can't force you to do the work. I love you, but I could still pack my bags. He's the kindest, most amazing man, but I didn't sign up for this. And this is what I do for a living. I do healing work. I, so it's good for everybody else, but not you. So you refuse my love. You refuse me. That means you refuse me. You refuse my help. You refuse me. Even though I know you're a man, I've got all these amazing people around me. And you ha a man handles things differently. But if you can't do this with me, and this is what I desire in a relationship is move to the next level of intimacy. And if you're not willing to do that, then I can't stop, slow myself down or hurt myself because now I become codependent. And that's what it was showing in a relationship. It shows you like, if your relationship goes to 640, be careful because it should be like a 5941, like this, like a seesaw. But if it starts to do this, then the separation and a woman is always going to be growing and expanding. So that's the part of us. We're always like, there's more, there's more, there's yes. more questions all the time. And that's because the divine feminine is like Ivy. It's always going to be going towards the light. And this is how I visualize it. I'm hitting cement right now. Mm -hmm. I'm hitting this wall of denial. I'm hitting my own issues. I'm hitting my own karmic, whatever you want to call it. However, if I'm in line with spirit and I accept that this is me just working through my own stuff and my own worthiness, my own emotions, whatever, and I go in there, Ivy can break through cement. <laughs> you cannot kill Ivy. It's like a woman. You can't kill her spirit unless you allow it. someone. And this, if I stopped and found that acceptable, it would kill my spirit. And mm -hmm. I would stop. And I love myself too much. I could still love someone. I still love him. Of course I do. And it hurts. But I know in the long run, this, it's, it's not going to work. And mm -hmm. He knows that. And you know what, too? When you put pressure on someone to do the work, you're actually being cruel. You're cruel. Because if they're not able to do the work or they don't want to do the work, what you're saying is, is you're not good enough for me. What you're saying is, is that I need you to be this in order to be loved. I need you to do this. That's cruel. It's like looking at somebody who has an addiction or, you know, I'll, I'll fix you. You need to go to rehab. You need to do this. You need to do that. No, the fastest way to heal or help someone heal is here's God. 
here's the person that has the issue and here you are, you're doing this. This is codependency. I'll help you heal, I'll show you, I'll do. No, what you do is you pull yourself out of the equation and that person now has to find their own connection to spirit to survive, whether it's cancer, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's grief, you need to pull yourself out of the equation and hold space. And I pray for you to find that connection. I pray for you to heal. I, I know you have the strength within you, but I can't get on the front line with you. That's pretty tough, Sierra. It's a, that takes a lot of strength to be able to walk, to step back like that. And it's, I know it's very painful for people that see people they love hurting themselves or, you know, from the outside looking in, seeing them not do what's so obvious to you that they need to do, or, you know, if they have an addiction or not taking certain action, it's so hard for us to see people we love hurting themselves, not doing something right. And but it's hard. We have to step back. What I hear you saying is, is, you know, that's not our battle to fight. That's their battle. We can hold the space and support them from the from the stands, right? From the bleachers, but we can't fight the fight for them. No, right? because they that they'll resent you. Because yeah, you're you're the savior, right? You're the hero. But why would you want to be the hero of anyone else's story but your own? Who are you? That's all ego. Who are you? You don't you can't heal them. That's this right. is no, the, heal themselves and have their own connection to spirit and the faster that they come into alignment with that the better if they can't and their soul doesn't want to do the work then you can't feel guilty or you can't feel that you didn't do everything possible to help them that's 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 ego you do not have that much control you know mm -hmm. and that's the hardest lesson to learn is to watch someone you love suffer but when you do and when you just hold space for them, and that's what a woman is so, her and her femininity is I'm holding space, but I'm not, because if I strip that away from you, you will not survive. Yes. You need to be like the butterfly in the cocoon. Yeah. You need to struggle. And when you come out, I'm here. Even when you're going through the struggle, I'm here, but I can't do it for you. And then that's where they build, you build self-respect, you build self-love and that, in that struggle, is the intelligence of love again. And that's where we have paralyzed people, our children and as women, and we think it's love and it's not love, it's codependency. You know, your job yes. is the most powerful huntress of all. And why? Because she has to protect and, and, and feed her babies. And then what does she do? She teaches her babies to do the same. To hunt for themselves, yeah. That's love. I want you to survive. I want you to be happy. I want you to have love. Without me, independent of me, you have to be independent in the world. I'm just the vessel. Mm -hmm. I'm just conduit to help you. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, Sierra <laughs> Bender. <laughs> Sierra, thank you so much again. Thank Everyone, you. please check out Sierra Bender's website and her Fit Body Boot Camp courses and her Four Body Method and her Goddess of the Core book, her other two books, all her online stuff, her social media, and God willing, her on my show again as we do follow up questions. And uh, thank you so, so very much. Everyone, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. Go ahead and rate the review five stars. And if you would be so kind as to give it a review and let us know your thoughts. Thank you so much. I look forward to being with you all again. And until then, aho, great spirit. Thank you.